Hello, what's up? Welcome to another edition of the Arena Craft podcast dedicated to Magic the Gathering Arena. My name is Arjuna, I am your host. Thanks for joining me for another episode. This week, I'm excited to share with you a collaboration I did with the Magic Arena Drafting Club podcast. So today we're going to be bringing you our top 10 underrated rares and mythics from Theros Beyond Death in the draft format. And we've each prepared a list of 10 and we probably have some overlap. So we'll find that out on the show. We've got a lot to get through today. So I'm going to try to move through this as quickly as possible. Just wanted to remind you that We have a $20 contest each month for people who share the show on the various platforms. So to qualify for the $20 prize, you can do one of the following. You can follow us on Twitter. You can like our Facebook page. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can join our Discord server. And you can also leave a review for us on iTunes. And we give a little extra weight to those iTunes reviews because they are so key. So feel free to do any one of those things to enter into the chance to win a $20 drawing. I really appreciate everyone who's done that so far. It's made a big difference. And a final thing I wanted to note was thank you for everyone who's been contributing to our Discord server. It's been a really fun place to be lately. Lots of deck list discussion. And also, I've had a couple of really cool conversations with people in our voice channel. So, you know, people have taken me up on the offer of just hanging out in the voice channel, and we've gone in there and discussed decks and and whatnot, and I intend to be doing a lot more of that. So, you know, if you want to just come and hang out, chat magic with people, maybe get in on some games together get some help with your draft, whatever, Um, I'm going to be in there. And also other members of our community have been hanging out there. So especially now during this lockdown, you know, people socially isolating and whatever, it can get a little bit lonely. So just come hang out, chat with folks and have a good time. So I'm excited to get to the crosscast segment of our show today. I am joined by Magic Arena Drafting Club extraordinaires, Sean and Jeff hailing all the way from thousands of miles away from me in the country. How are you guys this morning? Hey, we're doing good. How are you doing, Arjuna? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty chill out here on the West Coast. Now, remind me, where are you guys based? I know you're in the Midwest somewhere. Well, we're both from Minnesota. That's where we met Okay. Uh, back in 1990. Nice. And uh, I'm still here. Uh, Sean moved out to Oakland. Oh, yep. okay. I'm in California. Oh, right on. Okay, so you're you're with me on the on the Pacific time there, Sean. Yeah, he's making us get up extra early. You notice, Jeff? If if I didn't love you so much, man, it, it, this Saturday morning business would just be out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta do it because I drink my like 14 cups of coffee by this point, and then I'm I'm about to crash in one hour, so I gotta get all the talking. All right, right now. all right, we we gotta make it count right now. Sean, sounds like you're not feeling that well today, so you know we're just we're gonna have to forgive Sean if he's you know, just a little bit on the quiet side, but um, you're a super champ, man, for showing up today and and making this work. I would not miss this for the world, even if I have to lay here with my mic on mute, listening (laughs) to the two of you, I would do it. It's not that different from how we do our podcast anyway. That's true. Usually I'm doing most of the talking and Sean's trying to get a word in edgewise. And so this is going to be perfect. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, well, now we have two people trying to get a word in edgewise. So. Well, and we have a master at the helm, which I want to just say we are both extremely grateful for the ask and for this happening because what an uh, amazing opportunity. So thank you very much, Arjuna. Thanks so much, man. I mean, I feel the same way, you know, discovering you guys and having that sweet shout out on your podcast was was a big moment for me. And so, you know, I've I've been loving your show and I've been looking forward to this for a long time. And I, I just have to say as well, like, I love Limited and I really enjoy bringing that to my show. And, you know, I love the way that you guys approach Limited. I think it's like really real and, and sensible and fun. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm stoked. And so what we're going to do today is we are talking about the underrated res in the Theros Beyond Death draft format. And so this is what got me kicked off on this. And tell me if you guys relate to this. Maybe you don't, but you know, I've been taking in content just like everyone else and people posting, you know, what's the pick and, 
you know, maybe in the LR cast subreddit, looking at people, you know, posting help with their pack one, pick one and stuff like that. And I'd consistently see stuff like this. Someone would have a pack and the rare would be Nessie and Boar, right? And then in the pack, they also have Farika's Spawn and maybe like a Eroas's Blessing, you know, and they'd be like, well, you know, what's the pick, guys? What should I take here? I think it's Farika's Spawn, but I don't know. You know, and it's like I'm I'm sitting here at home and I'm thinking, there's a rare in the pack, man. And like, <laughs> that's a game winning rare right there. You know what I mean? And And so I've been seeing this happen a lot in this format. And that's kind of what got me going on this topic is that I almost feel like people are next leveling themselves too hard. or It almost feels like a hipster choice where it's kind of like, yeah, well, you know, I could take that rare, but actually there's like this, you know, really powerful uncommon in the pack and I'm just going to roll with that instead. Um, so have you guys been encountering this as well? Yes. So what I'm seeing is that this set is a uh most of the rares are much better than the other cards. We saw this very on early on the set when we were evaluating the commons. And one of the first things Sean said to me when we started recording was, did these commons suck? And I was like, yeah, they seem a little underpowered <laughs> compared to like Eldraine commons where like a Rimrock Knight was a super powerful card. Right. And so I think what we're seeing in this set is that the commons and the uncommons are a little powered down and that's making the rares just much better than everything else. Um, and so I think we have to go into it with that context. I also think it's powering these uh, four and five color good stuff decks uh, by paying attention to these rares and seeing them being passed and wanting to play more and more of them. I totally agree. Another thing that I've been noticing is that I feel like people get caught up in this mindset. So a lot of the uncommons in the set will provide you with some kind of an engine or will provide you with value or will will do good stuff. Like Shimmerwing Chimera. Yeah, perfect example. You know, that's a perfect example. Furious Rise, that's another great example of an uncommon that just it pull, it makes an average deck a great deck. Totally. And so I think that this set has done a really good job of, of having these uncommons that are powerful, that do good things for you. And so I think that that also pulls people in this direction of feeling like, well, you know, I can build a whole deck around this uncommon, you know, like if I take this... Like a, like a rise to glory. I've done that. I've early picked, you know, a couple of rise to glories and been like, I'm just going to get every or a removal I can find. You know? Totally. Oh, Hateful Eidolon, that's the card I was yeah. trying to think of, right? Totally, totally. I've gotten into trouble gone, going down that road too much. Yeah, right. And so they'll see one of these cards and they'll remember that sweet game where they got like three Myers Grasps and a Hateful Eidolon and whatever. And they'll be like, oh man, you know, maybe I should go in that direction. And they'll ignore that they've just got a broken rare in the pack or just a rare, which is an above rate creature with an above rate ability that you're just not going to get on any card at lower than rare. Yeah, I just, I feel like people have been slipping into this mindset of getting a little, the only way I can put it is outplaying themselves. Maybe like a little bit of fancy play syndrome or a little bit of trying to kind of next level the format and forgetting some of the draft basics. You know, if you have one card, which is twice as good as any other single card in your deck, you just need to be slamming that card. Right, because if you draw it, in two of your games that your win percentage goes way up in those games, you know, because even though you have a 40 card deck, each game, you only see a small percentage of it. And if your bomb is in there, it makes a huge difference. So that's something that I just recently had to level up on. And that exact thing, which is understanding that you're not going to even see that card. And especially in when you're only playing one game, not best two out of three, you may never see that card. Doesn't that suck when you draft (laughs) like, Heliad Sun's crowned and you go 0 and 3 and you didn't get to play it any of your you didn't see it, you know? Oh man. How about Ashiak? Oh yeah. Whoops. Another thing that happens a lot in this set is maybe you'll get a card like, you know, Dream Trawler, or you'll get a uh, Kiara Best the Sea God, right? And you know, you have an opening hand with Kiara Best the Sea God and your opponent goes turn one, pious wayfarer, and you're like <laughs> <Uh-oh>. Okay. <laughs> All right, well we'll see how this goes, right? How many turtles did I put in my deck? (laughs) And I think that goes to why having several rares in these decks and not just trying to fuel the engine around a couple cards is is big because you want to pull one of those rares in your opening hands, you know, uh, as often as you can. Totally. And just giving yourself the chance to draw into it. Limited, 
in my experience, is just so much about you're just trying to stack your deck in a way that you draw the cards that you want to draw, right? In Constructed, you're like, four of, four of, four of. You load it up exactly how you want it. You build your deck in a way so that you draw the cards that you're going to need in the amount that you need them, right? And in Limited, it's just a crapshoot. It's like every game is a crapshoot. And so, yeah, I feel like you just need to give yourself the highest chance of top decking a card that's going to be powerful and relevant the turn that you play it, whether it has like an overarching synergy in your deck or not. Sometimes you get lucky and, you know, you put together some bonkers constellation deck and it's just a nice 50-50 split and you can just rely on that synergy. But again, I feel like sometimes people lose sight of the fact that just having one card that's really powerful that you can just top deck or that you can have in your opening hand and build a game plan around is it's just such a strong thing to have in your pocket. Well, let's go back to your example. So Nessian Boar, turn five, think about that, a 10-6 on turn five in limited, right? You just, nobody does that, right? So any 10-6, any color, I don't care what abilities it has on turn five in limited is kind of a game ender most of the time, you know, whereas Freak of Spawn isn't. It's a great engine, but it's not a game ender. And green, you might be putting it down on turn four. Yeah, so each of us coming into this show has prepared a list of 10 cards that we feel like people are just passing a little more often than they should, or maybe people aren't considering all of the ways that one of these cards can can fill out their deck and help out. So why don't we just get kicked off right now? Jeff, do you want to lay on us one of your sure. 10 underrated rares? Yeah, let's go with number 10. First of all, I'll say that uh, where Sean and I come from is we're two good friends who play a lot of limited on Arena. Uh, we're not on Twitter a ton, you know, it, uh, we don't both watch Twitch a ton, you know, we do, but not a ton. We do go out to our local game stores, but mainly we play a ton on Arena. So what we see is what are the other cards we're never playing against, for example? So for me, that would be an underrated rare, right? Mm -hmm. Got it. So I'd like to talk about a little blue card called Ashiox Erasure. Mm, okay. When the set first came out, I thought this card was pretty bad, like nearly unplayable. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me read it off. It's uh, got a picture of Ashiok pulling some guy's soul out of his face. It's a flash enchantment for two colorless, two blue. When Ashiok's Erasure enters the battlefield, exile target spell. Your opponents can't cast spells with the same name as the exiled card. When Ashiok's Erasure leaves the battlefield, return exiled card to its owner's hand. So I think there's several things going on with this card. Um, I like the fact that it exiles the card because that's very important in this set. You can get a freak of spawn with it. Um, I like the fact that it's an enchantment in blue because uh, the blue green deck in particular wants every card to be an enchantment if at all possible. So there's synergies here. I'd like to mention that this says your opponents can't cast spells with the same name as this exiled card. This is one of those features that makes people think this card is worse than it is because that doesn't matter. Right? In limited. So people think, oh, that's a junk line of text there. Well, you're right. It is a junk line of text, but then just remove it from the card and then read the card again. And I think it's still a pretty good spell. Finally, when it leaves the battlefield, return exiled cards to the owner's hand. You know, that's really the big downfall of this and uh, why I would prefer to maybe hold on to this a little bit to make sure that like my green opponent has played out their um, their nature's claims and things like that. This is one of those cards that's a little bit hard to evaluate for limited because it is a powerful card. For example, we've all had those decks or played against those decks that did just somehow manage to pull four Maya's Grasps, right? Or like three Elspeth's Nightmares or whatever. And I think in a situation like that, a card like this can be surprisingly powerful, especially when you're drafting on Arena, because I'm sure you guys have noticed this too, but Arena will sometimes have those drafts where you get four Nessie and Horn Beetles. Yeah, these powerful commons are on commons that will kind of stack up because the bots aren't in them and the bots are also not making weird five color decks and, and stealing your Eros's Blessing or whatever that's tabling, right? And so, yeah, you'll you'll sometimes see these powerful cards and just none of the bots are really seem to be in that color. And so you'll just stack them up. Right. Like, I think you can get 15 Omen of the Deads and 15 Travelers <laughs> in your limited decks on Arena right now if you really want them. Like, can you, can you imagine, like, someone's playing the five color good stuff deck and, like, on turn four, they try to resolve their amulet to get that right. facing going on and you just snatch it? <laughs> 
<laughs> the dumbest counter spell ever. That sounds great. That's a meme right there. Yes. Did either of you have, have this stupid card on your list? <laughs> it did not make my list. Yeah, no. I think most of these cards are going to be narrow. I think that's kind of the idea of it. Yeah. Um, but this one is extremely narrow, Jeff. I, w- I would like to say I would take uh, Freak of Spawn over this, but I still think it's an <laughs> underrated card because I never see anybody play it, and I have played it, and I've had it be a pretty good card. Yeah, I think the obvious issue is you've got two other spells that do the same thing that pretty much that are one's cheaper and the but other one's common. But the, the Deny the Divine only gets creatures and enchantments, which, is, which I have found to be a little uh, irksome. Mm, yeah, that's true. Nice word. Well, and plus, no one ever expects the Ashiox Erasure, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> That's true. Nobody. That's true. <laughs> I could see it, like, for a Dreadful Apathy, I could see that being a nice move, right? Get, get one that's on the board, too. Does it, does it work like that? So, because I think you have to cast it on a spell that is on the stack. On the stack. Right? Yep. Yeah, right. That you know that would actually be pretty sweet if you could just slam it down on whatever, kind of like a, a Ixalan's binding kind of an effect. Yeah, then you'd both have it on your list. Yeah. Oh, baby, <laughs> dude! I'll tell you, I was like, I'm I'm a buyer of Ixalan's binding. That was one of my favorite cards from that. I set, love that card. Sure. I tried to make a bunch of standard prison decks out of that card. Like I'll just lock out four of your best cards <laughs> from the game with my four of. I love that card. Sean, what about you? What's what's one of your ten underrated rares? I'll take, um, as number 10, I'll take Labyrinth of Skophos. Oh, yep. That, that was uh, number 8 on my list, for sure. Yeah, so I see this rated as a D in some people's... Um, I, I, I kind of went around and looked at some people's ratings, too, to get an idea of what other people think. I don't do that very often, but I did a little research, and, and I, I can't believe it was a D. That kind of blew my mind, especially because I've used it to kind of remove some of the bigger problems in the game many times. Mm, mm-hmm. So I, I mean it's not it's not a it's not an A, but um, it's like a poor man's liar. That's what the way I like to think about it. And it's colorless. It is. You know, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I might get flamed for this. I think Labyrinth of Scophos <laughs> is better than any uncommon in the set. All right. Yeah. Ooh. That's my hot take. Now I'm I'm going to give you a few arguments as to why. All right. I'll, A lot of people think about this card as being a removal spell for the opponent's stuff. That's only half of the card, right? Right. It can also protect your creatures, and it can also make blocking a nightmare for your opponent. Think about an example like, let's say you have like a Rage Scarred Berserker that's just coming in at your opponent. 5-4, it's a pretty big boy. And they have like a, a kind of a typical limited board of maybe they have a freak of spawn, or maybe they have a couple two threes or something like that. And they're looking at your Rage God Berserker coming in, and you have a Labyrinth of Scophos, and they're like, what am I supposed to do? You yeah, know, you what can't I mean? double block anymore. That's right. You can triple block, but yeah, may- maybe, you know. It's a nightmare. You know, if you also have a combat trick or if you have anything else, it's there's no there's literally no way for your opponent to to win that. It's insane in in a lot of green decks because well, first of all, because you have a lot of big creatures, um, but also because I one of my favorite cards in the set is Nylea's Forerunner. It gives all mm. your creatures trample. Oh, and yeah. Labyrinth of Scophos is insane with Trample. I mean, you just remove a blocker from combat and your creature still gets through. I've never lived the dream of putting this together with that red uncommon that can fight a creature if they're trapped in the labyrinth. Have either of you, either of you ever done that? I've never pulled it off, have you guys? No, but that card wheels, which is one of the reasons why I think that, that, that you should think about taking this card. I mean, and it's a land, so it's going to make every deck... And everything you just said was brilliant. Like, I haven't actually done the removal on the blocking side of it, but that's brilliant. It's just so good. I mean, here's a third case scenario. Like, imagine you do swing in with your Rage Scar Berserker, and they block it, and they play a combat trick, right? And you're just like, okay, remove my creature from combat if I need to. Right, exactly. So I think that people are seriously underrating this card. I've also heard people say, oh, well... You know, it's a colorless land, and that's not free in in your deck. And I agree. Like, maybe if you're playing a three color or higher deck, then you you really need to like think about your mana base and whether you can support one of these. But I would go in the opposite direction. I would say like a land, which is also a removal spell. Like, are you kidding me? In limited, that's insane. 
You might even play 18 lands uh, with this in your deck uh, in some cases. Sure. Just kind of consider it your remo- a removal spell. Sure. I mean, if you have a higher curve, I think that's totally fine, you know? Which I think this wants to be in a higher curve because I do believe the best scenario is you're in a big stompy deck and they try to double block your creatures and you just take away that option. Totally. And it's a mana sink, right? So... If you do end up flooding out a little bit, but you get your labyrinth, then there you go. Like that's something you can spend five of your mana on every turn. So yeah, I I love this card. I'm I'm really glad that that uh, you brought this one up. So that's how you pick them, Jeff. Just so you know. Yeah, not on my list, by the way, guys. Um, <laughs> that's how you do it. Too easy of a pick. We got to go deeper, guys. Ashiox Erasure. I think we can all agree that's the okay. What's next? Who's next? Arjun is up. All right. All right. So. I'll, I'll head off with my number 10 on the list, Dryad of the Elysian Grove. Nice. Okay. All right. right. Here we go. So I think a lot of people look at this card and they just see a two, four, for three, and that's it. And I definitely agree, like, in some decks and in some cases, that's all this guy's going to be. Okay, let's say I was already in green and, you know, I've got a pretty strong start and my pack two, pick one has the dryad of the elysian grove in it but maybe it also has a like a warbriar blessing or some other card in green that would just be a stronger card overall in my deck so i'm not saying that i would always slam dryad of the elysian grove but i think especially as a pack one pick one people really underrate this card so let, let me give you my pitch for dryad of the elysian grove especially as a card that you can build around so first of all with this whole five color deck being a thing in the format dryad is just like one of the best enablers for that deck and you know okay it's weak to removal right i'm not saying that it like doesn't come with its fair share of liabilities but you know if someone has to waste a removal spell on your dryad that's really not the end of the world and if you just think about when you have this guy out you can just your mana taps for anything you want right and even in the average limited deck that can come up sometimes right so even if you've got a two color deck how many times have you had that opening hand where you're in a two color deck you have three land of one color and so it's just it becomes surprisingly relevant to unlock all of your mana to be able to do whatever you want with it i think that's a really underrated aspect of the card and it's a two four it passes the vanilla test which is really tough in this set. Uh, Most of the creatures don't pass the vanilla test in this set. Yeah, it's really relevant. So here's another thing is that when you have this card early and you're able to build around it, you can really do some disgusting stuff. So have I've played a standard deck recently, which runs Dryad with Nessian Wanderer. Mm -hmm. That is an insane combo. Yeah. You have to see that going off to really understand how powerful that is. Add in the Cetessian champion and really have some fun. It's ridiculous, right? And so if so if you start with a dryad, you can then keep your eye out for your Nessian Wanderers. And because it's an enchantment creature, it's a really strong start to a constellation deck. And I think it, it really unlocks things like There are so many times in this format where you'll be in, let's say, like a black-green deck, and you'll open a Utropia the Twice Favored, and you'll be like, oh my god, I really want to splash this card. Like, I don't know. You know, I don't know if I can make it work, right? And cards such as Dryad of the Elysian Grove just make a plan like that so much better. Totally agree. You know, I'm not necessarily saying that I pick this card super highly, but I think specifically as a pack one, pick one, or when you're already like in a base green deck, which is trying to do a five color thing. I think that this card just has a lot of options. Yep, it fits into constellation themes, both green, white and green, blue, because it's an enchantment creature as well. It's it's a good card. Totally. Is this one on your list, Sean? It is not, but it's it's I, I, I would pick it for sure. Yeah, it wasn't on mine either, but I think you actually kind of talked me into it. <laughs> I Here's the thing. I just think it's better than people think it is, you know? No, I think you're right, and I have seen this pack one, pick one, and I think too often I've just evaluated it as a vanilla creature. I'm just like, well, 2-4 is not bad for a 3-drop, and I'm not giving uh, enough weight to the... Uh, opening up all the other colors i get risk adverse when i think oh i don't want to rely on this but you can pair it up 
with your Omen of the Hunts and your Traveler's Amulets to make it all come together into that five-color deck. You don't have to just rely on this card. That's a really good point. It's like this can just be another point in your fixing suite. And it's especially a sweet combo with Traveler's Amulet because you could do something like play your land drop for the turn. You can crack your amulet, fetch your land, and slam that land in the same turn. So that's one of the things about Amulet. Running running cards like Amulet in your deck, which fetch up other lands, it increases the chances that you will play a land and crack that in the same turn. And so being able to just immediately ramp yourself in a situation like that, I think is is really strong. I totally agree. Do you ever find yourself when you guys are talking about this, uh, wanting to go play magic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, all right, guys, this has been fun. I gotta, <laughs> yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> I gotta Sorry. go fire up a draft, you know? That's right. <laughs> well, here's, here's the reason I want to go play because this next card I'm going to say, I've oh. never played with it and I've never played against oh, it. Oh, man. And that always bugs me. Have you ever had that when a set's almost over and you're like, I yes. still haven't gotten to play with this card? Many times. You, you've got me on the edge of my seat. So, so what is it, Jeff? Okay, I, I'm convinced this is a very good card, but I've seen it f- pack one, pick one, and I've passed it, and now I regret it, and I've never played against it, and I play a lot. Sean will attest to that. You know, I'm on Arena a bunch. I, I can usually get to Mythic in the seasons, and I, I'm on that thing a lot. And uh, Here we go, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Galia of the Endless Dance. Have you guys played with this card? I have. I've, I've played against it. I've never picked it myself. Okay, here we go. 2-2 two, two Haste. For two mana, red and a green. So that's just good already, right, guys? A 2-2 haste, 2, 2. It passes the vanilla test. It has haste. Come on, guys. We're already on board. This is already a solid filler card, but it gets better. Other satyrs you control get plus one, plus one, and have haste. So I don't think you'd want to go as far as putting in those little, uh, uh, that, that red uh, escape uh, card that makes little. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you're doing that. <laughs> but, I mean, there's there's other things going on here. You got Annex. You got uh, that 4-4 four, four that makes another little satyr. Let me like help those... you out. Let me help you out. You got Careless Celebrant. You got Thank Stampede you. Rider. You got Thank Hero you. of the Ritual. You got oh Nissan goodness, Wanderer. Sean. You got Nexus Wanderer. And you got Scola. Oh, the Grand Sean. Dancer. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And that's no this problem. This thing is a hero. Okay, now you also got uh, whenever you attack with three or more creatures. And by the way, you're attacking with all these satyrs just, Sean just talked about. You may discard a card at random if you do draw two cards. Sounds great. So, you know, obviously you pitch your land, you draw two cards. And you want this to be in a more aggressive deck, maybe a little leaner than your average red-green deck. Maybe you're not looking at that super high curve, five and six drops. Maybe you're looking at a little leaner version. But uh, I think this card's really good, and I've never played with it, and uh, I want to. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, cards bonkers. I think, you know, one of the only reasons I pass this card so much is just that I don't tend to be in uh, gruel that often but i mean i think that if you're in gruel it's a slam dunk and you know i would first pick this card out of like a weak pack you know like i probably wouldn't first pick this over a maya's grasp but i think yeah, see, i think that's where i've been at and why i haven't gotten to play with it because you know on, on arena it the downside of arena is that in pack three you don't get past a bunch of cool rares right if you draft in in paper or on mtgo people are going to pass you their rares in pack three because they're not in their colors and so you might end up with like a couple extra cool rares in your deck on arena that just doesn't happen so you don't get a card like this halfway through pack three because everybody else passed on it and that's why you kind of have to first pick it right and i i aspire to that someday that's such a good point i think this really highlights it's one of the places where you most feel the difference between arena drafting versus not because you're so right like the, that pack three you know wheeling or tabling crazy rares and all that kind of stuff it just never happens in arena yeah and i think that it, it cuts like almost whole archetypes out of the arena experience which is you know it's it's one of the bummers of drafting on arena let's be real it's true if you want to play this card my suggestion is that you think about playing it as the bottom half of your gruel um set and what i mean by that is like anything under a three drop and down you want it to be the the satyrs want to be the core of that part of the deck but your four drops and up you want them to be your regular big stompy bad boys that come in to to finish the finish it up like your um trample creature that that it that part of your deck doesn't change that much 
Yeah, Sean and I have been uh, preaching the gruel deck on the last several episodes of uh, Magic Arena Drafting Club just because uh, the bots let you make it. You know, red's pretty open right now, and we find just putting down a big threat with power of four each turn, you know, followed up by eventually by a furious rise is a pretty decent strategy on arena at the moment. Oh, totally. Yeah. I was listening to you guys talk about that on your last episode, I think. And I totally agree. I think the gruel archetype is one of the most underrated ones right now. I mean, if you log into my arena account right now, m- my current draft deck that I'm undefeated with is a gruel deck. Yes. It's so solid. And I, and I love that. I love how you guys are talking about this basic limited thing that people forget about or like they get a bit too fancy to remember. If your deck has 18 creatures in it or 20 creatures in it, that's just a threat every single turn. Right. I had this really formative experience back in uh, Triple Kaladesh draft that really stuck with me. Oh, that's before our time. That, that dates us here because because we we played back in we played during Mirage and Urza Saga and Tempest, but then we got out of the game until Dominaria, basically. Yeah, okay. So I'm old man Arjuna here, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, I had this draft and I played against this opponent and that deck, I, I kid you not, that deck, I'm pretty sure it was 22 creatures and one combat trick. Mm-hmm. They annihilated me. And the, there were some really good creatures in that set too. And so it was just like, Every turn, they were just slamming some energy creature, or slamming like a 4-4, four, four, slamming a 4-5 menace, stuff like this. And like I had a really sweet deck, and I just couldn't keep up. I had the removal, I had the synergy, I had some like good low drops, and they just stomped me out. It's, it's Limited's version of mono red in standard. In mono red, if you draw your curve properly, it's pretty hard for anybody to beat you. Playing gruel and standard and limited is usually the same thing. Just put a bunch of uh, put a bunch of beefy creatures in your curve because no other color can keep up because no other color has the stats at that curve. But you, the thing is, you have to curve out. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You can't just keep a hand of two Scofos war leaders and right. a combat <laughs> trick and just like expect to get that. You know, right now, yeah, love it, Gallia. And plus, she's you know she helps you keep up on your potassium. Am I right? Am I right? That's right. <laughs> No nervous leg syndrome. <laughs> All right. So, Sean, what's next on your list? Well, I had Gala. We'll just say Gala was my nine, but I'll, I'll tell you what my number eight was, and I'll stay in the land world, and I'll just group all these into big one big category and just say the temples in general. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, again, if it, with the five-color good stuff, and even when you want to splash, if that color is in any of the colors you're playing, I, I don't see people take it. I don't see people play against it. I know they're not great, but I I just don't understand it. Like they're decent enough, and in those situations, I think they're they're absolutely arguable. I'm with you. I mean, the scry is it can't be underrated. Or the the importance of the scry can't be overstated. Let's put it that way. Right. Yeah, I've been hearing people saying you should take these scry lands above a good playable in your deck, which I think is like a pretty strong endorsement. And I think that's where I'm at. If it if either side of it's on color, I'm going to take it pretty highly. Maybe not removal spell highly, but I, I think that they're really good. I'm completely on board. This was going to be uh, my number seven. So originally when I was putting together the list, I thought it'd be a fun troll to just put all five of these on the list. But not admit it. So like I would say, I would get to my number five and I would say one. And then you guys would be like, now do you put them all in there? I'd be like, oh, nah. And then I'd get to number four and I'd say the next and I would just go all the way up. Because I agree that these are maybe the most underrated of all the rares. Uh, splashing, but also just the scry. And I do think you only need to have one on color uh, for it to work. You're usually not playing anything on turn one in this set anyway, unless you're playing white. And I would say if you go by like the limited resources uh, grading scale, I think this is like somewhere between a B minus and a C plus as far as uh, ranking it against the other cards in your deck. It's going to be better than most of your common filler. And it should always make your deck. Yeah, there you go. It should always make your deck. Totally. And again, just underscoring the importance of lands and limited. It's like a free card. Yeah. If your land can do anything for you other than tapping mana, you should strongly consider that. 
But I'm kind of disappointed you didn't do that, Jeff, because right. I'd love to hear you. I want to hear your power rankings. Like, what are your temple power <laughs> rankings, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, white would be at the bottom, <laughs> okay. right? Okay. And since the buddy lands are in here, that would be, what, blue, white, and green, white? Probably green, white would be the, the weakest one, Yeah, because right? white's the one color where I want to play a pious wayfarer on turn one, and I don't want my stupid land to tap. That's that's compelling. That's compelling. So then you have to go with the grindiest color last, right? So blue black is going to be probably the best one because in that one uh, you're going to be able to wait till late game. So it's going to be somewhere around there. Nice, nice. All right. Well, you know, follow up with Jeff if you want the full. <laughs> that's, a, that's a Patreon tier right there. You know, right, that's right. exactly right. Yeah. I guess that brings me to my next one, which is Nyx Bloom Ancient. Now, this is my first mythic on the list. I'm not selling Nyx Bloom Ancient as like, you just need to slam this in in any green deck or whatever. But I think that a lot of people look at this card and they just pass it over. I do. I, you're going to have to talk me into this one. Okay. And you, you definitely talked me into Dryad, so I'm excited to see what you can do here to me. I've, I've always thought this was an unplayable card, so... yeah. Well, the common the common mythology is that it is unplayable and I will say like I've played this in two decks, I think, in across the breadth of the format, okay? But I think another thing that people forget sometimes is that mana being able to do stuff with your mana is really powerful. So, here's an example of a deck that I put Nick's Bloom Ancient in where it was just totally busted. I had a really excellent escape green black Golgari escape deck. And I had a bunch of escape creatures and with Pelucranos being at the top of my escape tree. So, you know, another mythic, which admittedly doesn't happen that often. But what I was able to do in this deck was that by the time I was slamming Nyx Bloom Ancient, I usually had a pretty stocked graveyard and a couple of escape creatures. And I also had Pelucranos and I had another I had another handful of creatures that also had activated abilities. I had a Scola Grove Dancer. Uh, I had a couple of those in my deck. I had some Mogis. What what's the guy who sacks creatures to draw cards? Oh, the, the Minotaur. Uh, it's the, the two three colorless drops. and the black. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So I so so what happened was I was looking at my deck at the end of construction and I was like I have a lot of activated abilities and I have a lot of escape and I have a lot of ways to turn mana into advantage. I'm going to try running my Nyx Bloom Ancient. And every time I played that card, it was game over. It was it it was just done. So if you've ever had the the joy of being able to play Nyx Bloom Ancient and Pelucranos on on the board together, it's disgusting. It's literally disgusting. Another card I'm imagining it would go well with is um, uh, Witness of Tomorrow. You get to scry for four mana, but it doesn't require a tap. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, because so basically for two mana, you get to scry. By that point in the game, you're doing scry three, scry four at the end of every turn. You're basically finding whatever you want. Yeah. You know, all your Labyrinth of Scophos, right? I mean, (laughs) that's got to feel pretty bad for your opponent. This is a cluster. That's what got us into your podcast, right? When you broke down clusters. We have our first cluster of the episode. I love it. Oh, okay. How about this one? Thassa, Deep Dwelling. (laughs) Yes. Okay, so a mythic which gets better when you play other mythics. That's not exactly what you're looking for in Limited, but... I just want to say, like, keep an open mind. You know what I'm saying? Because you, you'll you have these situations where you'll be looking at a just like a highly situational card like Nyx Bloom Ancient, and you'll be like, actually, if I get to untap with this, it's just, it's going to be bananas. So don't pack one, pick one this card. I don't pick it highly. But if I'm already in green and I see this card moving about in the draft, you know, maybe just like in the middle of a pack somewhere, I'm going to strongly consider taking it because the upside of being able to have that effect in your deck, if you want it, maybe in a certain matchup, or maybe you do just pick up a bunch of other cards. And if your deck is slow enough and grindy enough anyway, I think you can get there. 
I think that's a key to the format, actually, is that no understanding that you have to reevaluate in, in the words that you just used, which were, that's what you do so well, Arjuna, is it break things down. Um, but like doing that is you, I, I find myself doing what you just said almost after every pick in this, in this draft, um, than I did in any one before it. That having to reassess and reevaluate each card and what it does and how it affects my deck. And when I do that, I, I'm by far more successful than when I just say, oh, I'm, I'm already in these colors. I'm just going to right. stay in these colors. Or this is just a good comment. I'm not going to reevaluate it in the context of this deck. Totally. Yeah, card evaluation is so important in this set. I, I can't remember the last time like the course of a draft would change the value of cards for me so much like it does in this set. It's because the common sucks, so you got to get this synergy. <laughs> it's all about synergy because individually these cards are not as good. Like seriously, think about an adventure card right? compared to some of the commons we're seeing now. Head to head, the adventure cards are just better. Yeah, that's so true. All right, right on. Moving along, who's got their next underrated rare? All right, um, I got Thassa's Oracle here. Nice. It's a uh, two blue for a 1-3 Merfolk Wizard. When Thassa's Oracle enters the battlefield, look at the top X cards of your library where X is your devotion to blue. Put one of them on the top of your library and the rest on the bottom of your library in any random order. If X is greater than the equal to the number of cards in your library, you win the game. So I've had a lot of fun trying to turn this into a standard deck because that's my way of winning a game right there. Uh, and I didn't have any luck there, but I do think in limited, I've had much more luck with this. And th the fact that it's just a 1-3 that scries you two on turn two to me is already like very much good enough um, in a set like this to dig for your more powerful cards since this set is all about rares and synergy and getting your engine going. But also this is just a win condition. It might it doesn't even have to be your only win condition. I mean you can put this in a blue green deck if you want and just have it be another win condition um, or you can play it on turn two. But really this is a great win condition for a control deck. Have you pulled off a win with it in Limited so far? Yes. You know, it's it's not even like, oh, I have eight devotion. It's usually even less than that. You know, it's usually like I have three or four devotion. It's, it's not like you have to get a ton of devotion. Just games go late anyway. And you already worry about decking and losing the game anyway quite often in this format. So, you know, I like this. It, preferably, I want to put this in a deck that has cheap removal, you know, some big creatures with big butts to stay alive late, some good recursion, and then, you know, win the game with this as one of my possible win conditions. You're not playing this with Towering Wave Mystics, for instance, mm, which I see a lot of people trying to do. No, I don't think so. I think Towering Wave Mystic is a different type of card where you're like, uh, I think it's more of an aggressive card. Yeah. Honestly, I don't know how to use that deck well. I've heard it's good in the uh, blue red deck even uh, like there, apparently there's this blue red aggressive deck out there that I still haven't gotten a chance to get good at but yeah the Tower and Wave Mystic is a card I don't love and anyway whole different story I think it's best in blue black aggro where you're self milling and then if you mill it you have Omen of the Dead to bring it back to your hand Ooh, <clears> and I then like you're that. playing you know Sweet Oblivions and other things like that in case you need to kill yourself that way and then throw that down it that's the best deck I think that it's supposed to be in. Do you guys like see the makings of that deck on Arena a lot? Because I've never once found myself looking at my card pool and being like, oh, I could actually edge into that deck. I, I think blue is just really hard to play in this set. I, it, you get caught in between um, trying to play on your opponent's turn and trying to be aggressive, which is weird for blue. Of course, my mind goes to the controlling deck because that's what I want to do with it. Right. That's what it normally does so well. Right. Um, so that's where I get caught with it. And I, you don't see the pieces. I think you're right, Arjuna. You don't see these pieces very often in the draft. But every once in a while I do, like the Sweet Oblivions will come around and um, you can kind of make it work. I think this is one of those decks that you might just see a little bit more on Magic Online, right? You're probably going to see Othassa's Oracles moving around the table. And, and I think you also won't have bots that are like in blue that are just snapping up Towering Wave Mystic. You know, like I think there's a lot of, a lot of people in, in a real life 
draft will be in blue and they'll uh they'll just pass that to one because they're just like no nah, my deck doesn't want that right and then there's like someone else at the table who gets three of them or something and they're like okay cool i can go into this deck but i i don't yeah i just don't feel like that happens as much on arena we're all gonna have to adjust soon right there they promised uh uh real drafts on arena a, a bit ago and now it sounds like they're getting really serious about it because they're saying that's the ultimate uh, form that the cube is going to take and Sounds to me like, you know, maybe within six months, we're going to see uh, some eight person drafting on Arena. And that's uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm so stoked. I literally cannot wait. I really hope they make it possible for you to choose like these eight people to do uh, a draft. That'd be so awesome. Fun. To get uh, your buddies together to do a draft. on. Oh, Get some podcasts together. That's yes. right. That's right. We're actually joining uh, another podcast uh, is doing a um, little invitational this weekend because nice. nobody's going to tournaments. So they're hosting an invitational on Smash GG. So I'm bringing my uh, <clears throat> standard Merfolk Secret Keeper deck. Ah, that's right. It's going to be ahead of the format once I show it to everybody. <laughs> oh, God. The Simic Adventures thing with the Secret Keep has been catching on, man. Has it? Oh, yeah. That's because I mean, uh, Sean, I told you. I'm, um, what do they call that when you're the first one in like a, a pandemic, for example? Not that that has anything to do with <laughs> no, what's happening in no the world right now. No correlation to current events. Uh, <laughs> Agent one or something. There's a name for that. Um, yeah, patient zero, I think, or something like that. Yeah. I have a time stamp too, so we can go back and listen to the podcast where I revealed it. You know? <laughs> back to Thassa's Oracle. You can, you can claim it. Um, yeah, Thassa's Oracle. It's just good because you can draw a card. Yeah. Yeah, and the, I mean, this, it's just good on its own. You don't need to win the game with it. All right, I wanted to take a moment to make a few shout outs here. This is a new segment I'm introducing to the show. And basically what it's going to be is this is a place for me and for any of our listeners to just call out people that they've played on the ladder. Maybe you had a sweet game against someone and you just want to give them some props. And so I've made a channel in the Discord for this called Shoutouts. And so feel free to just drop any shoutouts you want in there and I might read them on the show. Here are mine for the week. I wanted to shout out to Antarctica77. I had a, an epic match with this person on the ladder uh, playing best of one. And I was playing the five color Niv Mizzet Fires deck, which uh, Rich G from the Mythic Legendaries podcast inspired me to play. I've been a big fan of Niv Mizzet and uh, the Reborn version, of course. Ever since they printed it, I've been building these random five-color decks, and I think now is a better time than ever to be running it. So I, I was playing this five-color Niv deck, and my opponent was playing a blue-white control deck, and despite all the amazing value I got out of Niv Mizzet and Hydroid Crisis and all kinds of shenanigans my opponent was just able to grind me out via a combination of a million counter spells and a fey of wishes going into the wish board and i think they wrathed me like five times including a bunch of wrath from the wish board so anyway this is just a really sweet game i almost came down to decking but they resolved a finale of glory in the 11th hour and killed me anyway so that was a really amazing game and uh another awesome game that i had was uh Kenny B. Ross, I believe, and I was playing in a Simic Ramp matchup, same five-color deck. We This one also almost went to decking, but I, I was victorious this time, and I was able to work through multiple iterations of the Thassa agent combo through uh, using Teferi to bounce my stuff back to my hand, having to wrath the board once with a, a Fae of Wishes grabbing a wrath from the sideboard. And I was finally able to get there against them, but it was a very close game. So thanks to both of you guys. That was a really good time. Yeah, feel free to leave your own shout outs in this channel and maybe I'll read them on the show. All right, back to the programming. All right, I'm going to keep us moving along here just because got more cards on our list. So Sean, what's, what's your next card? Let's see. So Thassa's was pretty high up on my list, but I'll go on to Bronze Hide Lion. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Bronze Hide Lion. Um, I think we all know this one's a, a, a white green um, for a 3-3 three, three lion that if you pay white green, it is indestructible. And when it dies, it becomes an enchantment that enchants one of your creatures that has the text 
if you pay blue green i'm sorry white green it is indestructible so i like this card a so lot i first picked it a few different times and i've i've found that it really does and can work quite well as a two drop it's already pretty far ahead of the game but the, the catch with it is a couple things one you, you kind of do want to be in a white constellation deck because you can pump it with the pious wayfarers and you get um, all the other enchantments that you're going to want to put on it like the plus one plus nasty. one eyes pumping this thing it's already so big yeah so and then the Kaimetra's blessing is the other thing you kind of have to have um with this card to protect it the other downside is that it dies to Meyer's grasp no matter what because it just you know so that can be something that you'll get blown out with so i just want to kind of don't i don't play it if i if i don't have a uh Kaimetra's blessing in my hand and three mana if i'm against black but I mean, still, you're you're using your two drop, and they're spending their premium removal on it. That's not a bad exchange. No, it's not terrible, but it it does doesn't feel good. <laughs> I I do think like it's it is good to be strategic about it, and maybe just have another creature in play. Exactly. Just being able to get that sweet value if it does die, you know. That's mm-hmm. a uh, that's a real limited skill that uh, I think we can all get better at and definitely new players can get better at that is playing out your best cards as soon as you can is not always the right thing to do. Mm. And we were talking about Death Sea before the show. He's he's a master at that. He'll always like wait to play out his better cards until he's sure the coast is clear. Totally. And I mean, you know, in some cases you can afford to do that. And so, you know, it's like, why not? It, it does suck when you like, when you lose a game because you slow rolled your, <laughs> your better yes. cards, you know? So. Ugh. It depends on your deck and your opponent's deck, but there's definitely situations where, especially in this set, where you're like, well, this card is better than every other card in my deck, so I'm going to be a little more precious with it. I had a game where I was playing against a blue deck, and I had Kiara Best the Sea God in my hand, and they just kept leaving mana up, and I was super paranoid, and I didn't play my Kiara Best the Sea God, and it turns oh. out... They had no counter magic, yep. and I totally, uh, I just totally no. punted that game. It was awful. What do you do there? <laughs> uh. That's tough. Yeah. Sometimes it's the right thing to do, but you're even less likely to play it because it is so precious, right? Because yeah. you finally got the best mythic in the whole set. Yeah. And you just want to resolve it so bad. You know, sometimes you just got to jam, man. Like, this is yeah, something right. I learned playing standard against Simic Flash. Just got to jam, man. Yeah, put it down. Yeah. All right. Uh, next on my list is Thassa's Intervention. This card, I think... Like, I think sometimes people forget that this card can just be dig through time. Yep. And that's a really powerful card, y'all. And so I just, I think that a spell that can scale with the game, like a spell that can counter an opponent's three drop when you need it to, and a spell that can dig for five when you need it to, uh, is just really freaking good. Again, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I think Thassa's Intervention is better than any uncommon in this set. I totally agree with that. The double X to counter spell means it really scales with the game well. Sometimes I forget that, that uh, you don't need that much mana to counter their stuff, even if they have a bunch of mana left open, because there's doubling X on the how much they have to pay. And it goes back to what Arjuna said before, too, about how this is a card you don't mind top decking late in game. It's totally fine. You're great with that. It's almost best, then. Yep. Yeah, I like cards that always give you value, and... I just think that it's seldom that Thassa's Intervention isn't going to be the best card in your hand in Limited. It gets you what you need. It does what you want. You get to choose how you get your value out of it. An early game counter spell, which draws you two cards in the late game, is like bonkers, you know? It's very good. Very good. Right on. Uh, who's up next? All right, I'm up. Here we go. I'm going to throw down Clothis, God of Destiny. Uh, one red green indestructible four or five as long as your devotion to red and green is less than seven clothes isn't a creature so first of all i'm going to say i don't really care about that part of this um i don't care if this isn't a creature obviously in a gruel deck this is a a huge bomb and nobody's going to argue with me that it's a great card but what i want to argue for is this is a card that you want to splash for the second effect and the second effect is at the beginning of your pre-combat Main phase, exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a land, add a red or a green. Otherwise, you gain two life and Clothis deals two damage to each opponent. So I like the second half of that where you're um, getting rid of their escape creatures as well as the rest of their graveyard and basically uh, ticking them down that way. You can just win the game with this card if their graveyard's big enough, hitting them for two every turn. 
I just faced against a deck with Clothis the other day and like they got it down on turn three and I was just, I may as well just concede right now. <laughs> Especially if you're relying on any escape creatures. Yeah, it's broken me a few times in this in this set too. It's good. It's really good. It's indestructible, man. <laughs> it's yeah, like, it's just, it's not fair. You know what this card is like? It's like on turn three, your opponent resolves an indestructible Pegasus that's just online every turn, you know? <laughs> yeah, I love this card. And, uh, it, you know, I almost put on Heliod Suncrowned on the list just because I think that's splashable as well. But I thought that was a little too much cheating since it's a single color card and just everybody knows these gods are good. Um, but this god in particular... Uh, I think you can just splash it and treat it as an indestructible enchantment for three mana that could eventually win you the game. Yeah, I would jump through hoops to put this card in my deck. Sean, next up. I've got to, I, this one might be controversial a little bit, but I've gone back and forth with it too, but I'm, I'm going to throw out the um, the wave break hippocamp. So whenever it's just a, a three drop um, in blue, whenever you um, cast a spell on your opponent's turn, draw a card. Um, so have you guys played against this card or have you, have you ever drafted it? Uh, I'm, I'm a big buyer on this card. I played with it a lot and yeah, I think it's insane. Yeah. And especially if you're going into that deck anyways, but you don't have to be. And I find it, um, maybe you tell me if you found this to be true too, but I almost found it better. Um, when you're in either the five color good stuff deck, it's one of those cards you really want to have or, um, just if you're playing um, green blue and you're and you're just playing the enchantments that you want to play in that deck anyways, it's just on on their turn. Draw a card, get a land, and hey, I'm going to draw another card for doing that. Why not? And if you've got this, um, this that fish in play too, then you're tapping down one of their creatures every turn or untapping one of yours, which no one ever uses it for. <laughs> I forgot that that card could even do yeah. that. I had to read it again the other day. <laughs> So that and that can be actually super huge because you can you can tap down their creature on their turn or untap your creature as a defense to to block if they come in, which they don't think about. Most people don't. If I get this card in my deck, I'm definitely slamming like Nyad of the Hidden Coves and yes. Vexing Gull and the Turtle. Yeah, if you if you resolve Omen of the Sea into one of these, you feel like you're playing Legacy or something. It's like <laughs> exactly. Or if you get to draw, if you do the land where you drop a land in play and draw a card, that feels really good too. Yeah, I, I think that this card is just super busted. However good you feel like it's going to be when you read it, like it is actually going to be that good. You know, like how some some cards seem like they're going to be good, and then you play them and they don't actually end up being very good. But totally. Every time I've had this card on the battle, like it, it has drawn me minimum one card every game I've played it, unless someone like immediately removed it. So right, yeah, yeah. Omen of Fire is not pleasant, but <laughs> no. Uh, um, but have you guys played against it very often? Because I, I've, 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 I don't lost think I've it. ever. Oh, really? Okay, so I've maybe lost to it, me. and it, I have to admit I can't make a card like this work because I just do not get. The blah, the blue go on your turn decks in this format. I feel like I've had them explained to me and I've definitely tried them and they're just, uh, they elude me, but I agree with you that this is a super good card. I'd also like to point out that you two are talking very well with each other. Neither of you have stepped on each other, each other's words. I aspire to do that someday. You, you guys know when to jump in, but I'll continue to step on you two uh, at every chance I can get <laughs> apologetically. We need at least one, right? That's, that's <laughs> so true. Keep, keeps the variety, man. <laughs> I think this card's sweet. I would definitely first pick it and, and just not look back. And I, I've played it probably more, actually, like you were saying, in the blue-green uh, enchantments deck. I just think it's a really good fit there. Me too. I, one of the reasons it's better in that deck is that I think you're a little bit more likely to main opponent's main phase your stuff on their turn, right? Whereas in yes. like a more blue controly deck, you might just have like a couple of counter spells in your hand and not be able to leverage this card. Correct. Um, but like, yeah, in the enchantments deck, yeah, you got your omens and, you know, you've, you've just got like a little bit more options that you can play even to not have to counter your opponent's play. And um, yeah, I love this card. I think it's great. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to move on to my next underrated rare, which is Hactos the Unscarred. Mm. Whoa. Okay, this card just does not get respect, man. Like, I don't know what Hactos did in the locker room to, like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, no one wants him on the team. And 
this guy just wins me. I'd say he's gotten me like a 40% win rate just on his own when I play him in my decks. And it's just a problem. So when I'm building decks in limited, I really value cards that I resolve that my opponent immediately has to deal with. Okay, like Hactos can be very weak, right? So there's definitely times when like you resolve a Hactos, next turn your opponent just drops some like dumb two drop and you're like, great, all right, this was kind of an expensive boondoggle. It didn't get me anywhere, right? But I've also had games where like I resolve Hactos on turn four, my opponent ropes, and then <laughs> you can you can just tell the game's over, right? You are gone. It's just go. done. And so maybe I like to cut variants a little bit more than most people, but I just think that there are boards in which Hactos is an unbeatable threat, and I don't understand why you wouldn't. I don't understand why you wouldn't first pick this guy. To be honest, I think I can tell you why. Because the first time I ever played against this card. It, it was a zero, right? Because they played it and they rolled a two and I had a two drop, right? And so then that did something to my brain where I said, well, I'm never going to pick this card. And I think it's because this card is either a 10 or a zero. Yeah. That if you have an initial experience with it, that it's a zero, you don't realize that even though it was horrible in that situation, it's such a binary card that it's also a, an I win the game card. And yeah. so I think for somebody like you who's played it multiple times, you have a better idea of how often it's successful. But for me, my personal bias, you know, I maybe played against this twice and both times I beat it. So my brain just goes to it's bad because I don't have that pool of knowledge to draw from. The thing about a card like Hactos is you just have to have a little imagination. For example, if you've ever had to deal with a Hactos with a commanding presence on it, yeah, that's not <laughs> fun. <laughs> <laughs> which I, you know i run that card right or like oh yeah or like if i'm running hactos i'm a lot more likely to run the um what, what, that chimera combat trick that gives a creature first strike absolutely yeah, yeah or because what about, would the wings work good on them too because then they can't oh, block absolutely. it anyway yeah absolutely right. right and so you got rap and flames too you can hit three ooh, other creatures and bye bye flames can't... i like that yeah right? it's nasty right it's nasty and think about because if you have any of that stuff then they have to have a creature answer right um because you know i mean okay like occasionally you roll two and your opponent has a maya's grasp or whatever but if you think about it the removal spells in the format are very specific and the chances of your opponent having a removal spell at the right cmc for this guy when you resolve it is just pretty slim it's much it's much more likely they're going to have a blocker that is, yeah that's the two cases i beat it at least yeah Exactly. You know, and there are certain decks that just like actually just can't beat this card. Like, for example, I was playing against a blue green deck and they they just actually had zero answers for Hactos in their deck. I remember they got me once by this was some sideboard tech, which is pretty sweet. They flashed in their turtle and then they cast the plus three plus three combat trick on it. Oh, no. <laughs> and that that's how they took down my Hactos. Oh, I'd be okay with that. Yeah, right? Like, that that was a decent trade. Is this my favorite rare in the set? No. But, again, this is one of those cards where if I'm red-white, I absolutely think Hactos is just a stronger card than any uncommon that I could pick for my deck. And I think that I might be an outlier with that opinion, so... You know, I can I can un I can imagine some people listening to this and just kind of rolling their eyes, but I stand by it, man. I think that this card is bonkers, and I think it's worth rolling the die on it. Well, you're definitely making the segment go longer because none of our cards are matching up. Sean, did you have that one? <laughs> I didn't, but I get behind it 100. percent Yeah, I can see it too, and now I want to play with it and put some wings on it. That sounds great. Yeah, and you know, yeah, worst case scenario, they answer it. No big deal. That's right. Jeff, what you got for us? Uh, I'm not the first one to really like this card. I think it's Lords of Limited talks this one up quite a bit. It's Treacherous Blessing, two colorless, one black enchantment. Heck when yeah. Treacherous Blessing enters the battlefield, draw three cards. Whenever you cast a spell, you lose one life. Whenever Treacherous Blessing becomes the target of a spell or ability, sacrifice it. So we, we want to try to make this work as a uh, three mana, draw three cards in black, which is an insane spell, right? You can't even get that in older formats, right? That rate is incredible. Yeah. So how do we make that happen? Well, there's a lot of things in this set that can target an enchantment. For example, you can target it with your um, Shimmerwing Chimera. 
Um, you could target it with like a, uh, that blink spell, then you, you do use up your blink spell that way. Um, I, and I believe there's things that you can, uh, sacrifice a creature or enchantment, um, in the, uh, in the black red colors. So there are ways to target this and to get rid of it. But even if there's not, if you play this in an aggressive deck, um, then you don't care about the life you're losing because this is just extra gas. Think of it as a red deck wins and this is your light up the stage. Oh, and with final flare, it's your best friend, right? Ooh, there it is. There it is. Totally. This, okay. I'm so glad that you brought this up because I, this is one of those cards I still haven't been able to evaluate for myself how good I think it is in the format. And I could be swayed either way on it. How first pickable do you think this card is? Do I take it over Farika's spawn as I feel like what the question yeah. should be for myself here? And that's exactly. a pretty tough one for me. Oh, I probably don't have the guts to take it, but I, f- I kind of feel like it's the right move. And I felt like if I explored this set more, I would eventually learn that there are ways to build decks where this is absolutely the right card to take. Yeah. I just currently don't play black super aggressively. Um, but I feel like if you find better ways to make that work, um, that it is a better card than Farika's spawn. I, I suppose that's a indirect answer. M- my current self would take Farika's spawn, but I do think that if I leveled up, this is a more powerful card. Three cards for three mana is insane in any set of magic. It is. You know what I think this might be like? I think this might be a place where Sam Black or LSV would pack one, pick one this, but Andrew Andrew yes. Cunio wouldn't, right? So sure, yeah. Like, <laughs> And I, I don't know, maybe Andrew, Kuhn, you know, I'm not going to speak for any of those guys, but I just have a feeling like, you know, people might break different ways on this one. Absolutely. This is totally an LSV card. I think this pushes you really hard into black red. You kind of have, you kind of have to be and and for better or for worse, from what I've found, maybe this is wrong, but I think black red is the, by far the worst color pair in this set. And so I have not been able to make the sacrifice deck work in any way, shape or form. And people who play against me, I generally beat. And I think this card just works really well in that deck. So the other place that is useful, and I, I actually think now that, now that I think twice, is in the five-color good stuff. If you can use it there with those final flares, that is, that's the key right there. Because that's the deck you want to be wrapping cards into your hand with. Yeah, and that, car, that deck does play final flares. You know, this is another one of those cards where I actually think the earlier you pick it in the draft, the better, because it just gives you more opportunities to build around it. I probably wouldn't just throw it into my random deck running black, but it is one of those things where I almost feel like pack one, pick one is like the best place to take it because then you have the entire rest of your draft to decide whether it's going to make your deck or not. But yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Jeff. I think that this card is super powerful. And like, I think the drafter who is able to put this in their deck and actually make it work has such a leg up on the competition. So yeah, I think this, I think this one's worth getting out of your comfort zone for and figuring out where it works and where it doesn't. And I totally think you can get that with it. Here's another thought I just had is to put this in the uh, in a white deck. You know how most good white decks in this set are aggressive and mostly white? And uh, things like Pious Wayfarer really like it when you play an enchantment. So what if it, this is almost like the top, part of the top of your curve of a white-black aggro deck? It triggers your Pious Wayfarer as well as fuels you. And you don't care that you're losing a little bit of life because you're the one on the aggression anyway. And also that deck does have ways to gain small amounts of life. Yeah, like Daxos and Pegasus. I think that's a really good point. Like if your deck already has some life gain in it, then you might elect to bring this in, you know, just because you might see it as worth it, right? Or especially if you're playing against a slower deck that's not pressuring you. I think that's another that's another good thing to think about. Let's say you're playing against like a blue-black control deck then you might just run this card anyway because that deck's not trying to kill you through life loss anyway, right? And I mean, if you're playing ranked best of one, then that doesn't matter. But I play a lot of best of three, and so I definitely make a lot of sideboarding decisions in my draft. Agreed. Either of you have this one? Yes. Ooh, we're shortening the segment just a teeny bit. (laughs) I did not have this one on my list, but I agree that it is super underrated. All right, Sean. All right, what's up next for you, Sean? I'm down to like number three here, I think, or number two, actually. Um, so let's see. I'm going to take um, Eldon, 
Eldron of Obstruction. Eidolon, thank you. Oh, Eidolon the, the two on Fast Striker. Yeah, in white. And I will go ahead and say that you should first pick this. I'm going to jump right out there and say you wow, should. Hot and I did, I did it last draft, yep. And you want hot <laughs> taking it. Um, you definitely want to be in white. White is obviously one of the colors right now that it's easiest to get into on Arena. I think you guys would both agree it's almost always open. Um, it does all the things you want to be doing in white. You want to pump this thing. Um, you want to put all the enchantments on it. It works great in white, green constellation it works really good with the fight um abilities and all the uh, other things that you get out of that um and the deck i'm playing with right now in best of three is that uh deck and it is very good right now i'm three you know it, it kind of fits everything that white wants right it's a cheap creature with a bigger power than defense it has first strike which we don't see a lot of in this set it's an enchantment so it's bumping up your pious wayfarers and yeah white does have a lot of pump spells as well as enchantments to make its creature bigger and put that on a first strike creature and now we're talking and there's not a lot of first strike in this set and it's obviously really good in red white as well especially when you're playing the hero lineage so that you've got you know you're just pumping it even more and more and more it just gets out of hand all right so i totally agree with you this is on my list but you're playing against we're playing best of three and your opponent has two mogi's favor do you take it out you just yeah. take it out yeah yeah it's go- it's gone you know i was so conflicted about this card and whether to put it on my list or not and i i ended up deciding not to because i just still felt like it wasn't good enough so maybe i'm still underrating this card with with the flash abilities of the white enchantments that you can use the one two i don't use it often but it does that's what i would probably pull in my deck if if i was playing against mogis so they throw it on and i throw that on and oh sorry now it's even better you're bringing me around to this idea that a a two one first strike enchantment creature for two would just be very bonkers in this set if it weren't at rare right like that would be a premium on common i think especially like you said for the green white deck right so yeah I, I don't know it's interesting so okay so so you would first pick this over like a final death or a, uh or maya's grasp mm. we're putting you to the, putting you to the task yeah that's Sean. that's the real putting question the <laughs> so i didn't have to in that pack <laughs> um and so would Here, Sean, I? i'm gonna let you off the hook by Asking, asking you to talk about something different here about the card. What, okay. There's an ability on this card that I believe makes people think this is a bad card. Right. Because the ability is so dumb, people think, well, that's not never going to matter. Therefore, this card isn't going to be as good as it can be. If they would take off that text that says Planeswalker's abilities cost more, right? I swear people would think this card is better. They'd be like, oh, wow, two one first striker in white that's an enchantment? Perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I agree. It's that's why the vanilla test was invented, right? Cuz you know, this this used to happen all the time. Like people would look at a creature and just be like, "What an awful ability." And you'd be like, "Yeah, but is it a good creature?" Yeah. Uh you know what? You're opening my eyes, Sean. I'm going to I'm going to give a little more respect to this guy moving forward. Yeah, then you're going to get Mogi's favorite on turn 2 after <laughs> you play it and then you're going to never do a podcast with us again. Well, I'll I'll totally take the hot take too. Why not? And we got to go on the limbs every once in a while. Right? I'll say I'll take it over Myers Grass because Here's the thing. Right now in Arena, I think your chances are so much better getting good cards in white that mm. that's a reason to do it. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I do love me some white, man. I'm <laughs> yes. And like Jeff said earlier, the more white you are, the more white you want to be in, in this. It's like white wants to be white in this. Yeah, the ideal, the ideal white deck splash is a little bit of red, you know? Yep. So the next card on my list is... Also, another card that I would easily take over any uncommon in the set, which is Arasta of the Endless Web. So mm-hmm. I think I think that this card is seriously underrated. Um, first of all, I think a 3-5 reach for four, especially in this set, is just bonkers. There are so many annoying flyers tooling around, and this thing can block a lot of flyers even if they have commanding presence on them and and then just the ability to pick up incidental spiders here and there like having a card like this in play i think makes you remember how many cards are sorceries or instants that you didn't really think about right 
Yeah, it's so annoying to final death this thing and they still get a blocker out of it. Exactly. I mean, like, that's such a good deal for you. Like, you're up on a creature, you're up on mana. And and it's an enchantment creature, so it fits really nicely into a constellation deck. I think that this creature is quietly one of the better creatures in the format, and I just don't think it gets a lot of respect. I think this card loves blue... I'm sorry, green, black, and green, blue. It just loves those two decks so much. I love this card. This is an A in my my opinion, 100%. Sean has a poster of Arasta in his room. (laughs) Two of them. Prays to Arasta every morning. There's like a bunch of unswept spider webs around it. (laughs) Oh, my wife would kill me. Does she make you kill the spiders or put them outside? Um, Outside. My wife makes me kill them. Kill it! I have that one too. That's a quite a good card. And it passes the vanilla test, which again, most creatures in the set doesn't do, but it also happens to have like three other great stats to go with it. All right. What, what you got for us, Jeff? I got Storm Herald, two color, this one red. This is a uh, human shaman, three, two haste. When it enters the battlefield, return any number of aura cards from your graveyard to the battlefield attached to a creature you control. Exile those auras at the beginning of your next end step. If those auras, auras would leave the battlefield, exile them. Inst- so yeah, the auras go away forever. I saw uh, Caleb MTG play, trying to put together a super cool old modern deck with some cool Eldrazi aura that I had never seen in my life with this card before. So it's uh, Eldrazi constri- conscription, yeah, yeah. It's it's neat to like have these periods of time I never played, and then to see these players pull these things out and make them work with new cards. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, so it's already a three-two haste for three in red. So we need to just think about that first. That you know a lot like in a white red aggressive deck having a a three power haste creature is just good i don't think there's another three power haste creature for three in the set for example to show you how like premium that is but this aura uh attachment people were getting me with both warbriar's blessings as well as aroas's blessings with this thing and it just wasn't all that hard to do so what i think you're looking at with a card like this is the the downside isn't that bad a three two haste is already like a C, maybe a C plus. And, uh, but the upside is very high if you have just a couple blessings of either type in your deck where this thing then comes into play and removes your creature and attacks. As a fan of commanding presence, I think that this card is super sweet. That's the thing. This set's so full of enchantments that make creatures good, or just enchantments that go to the graveyard, auras that go to the graveyard. And the ones that you mentioned are just a perfect example. And if you get to reattach even one removal spell with this thing, you're really doing it. And even if your fail case is just getting another swing in with your commanding presence, you know, on like your, what, like five for haste first strike creature, like that's pretty good. It also, sorry to bring up Final Flare again, but it, it makes Final Flare just Ooh, ridiculously that's good. That's nasty. Nice. Right? You suit them up, then you kill their creature, and then you attack and suit them up again. Oh, yeah, because it doesn't get eggs. Wait. Hold on a second. If those auras would leave the bat... Oh, no, it gets exiled. Final Flare? Would leave the, uh, oh, no, Final Flare doesn't get exiled. But the... Right. Okay, yeah, you got it. But anyway, um, I know <laughs> early on in the format... Um, I played this card hoping to get the Mondo combo, and all I played was a 3-2 Haster, and I was disappointed in the card because I'm like, oh, I didn't make it work. So then my opinion of it went down, and I stopped drafting it. Um, this sounds like had, a common theme. Right, like because if a card's already good, but it doesn't do the awesome thing, then all of a sudden you're disappointed in the card. Mm-hmm. But like, you got to keep in mind, this is still just a very good card. Mm-hmm. It's just a sweet pack one pick one because now you can weight your auras really favorably. And... You can you can do a lot of really subtle stuff with this card that you might not quite realize. There are just like a lot of random kind of dorky enchantments that might just give you an attack you otherwise didn't have or might let you not have to spend your mana doing other stuff on that turn. So if you had a Pious Warfare in play, then you get the trigger off that. Oh my god! Just came into play. Can you imagine like having two Pious Wayfarers in play, oh, slamming yes. this guy, and having like <laughs> a couple bars? In it. That's like <laughs> bonkers. <laughs> I try to explain how cool it would be to my family, and they just give me blank stares. <laughs> They're just like Jeff, take that spider out of your room. <laughs> <laughs> get it out. How about turn three? You put that down. Turn four, you drop aspects of Lamprey. 
turn do it. five oh, don't be you nasty, sacrifice don't. the lamprey attack again and so they have to drop four cards oh i actually had an opponent do that they they lamprayed me with the three two haster and it was as filthy as you think it is like it was oh. it was disgusting Ugh. so i only got one card left was either of that was that on either of your lists no <laughs> no no it i thought about make, it had to make room for the maze huh <laughs> Right. So what? Right, you're up, Sean. So so what's what's your last one, man? You got to hit us with it. I, my my number one, and again, I don't think I'm on a limb on this one. Is Protean Thermitage? Oh, I think this card is ridiculous. Oh, yeah. yeah, I just think it's so good, and I don't think people think about. Or maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe they do. I haven't seen it used correctly except for once, and I got beat down so bad by it. And here's what they did: it was blue black. Um. They played this, and then they would just mimic whatever creature I had on the board. I was playing uh, red-green. So they would just copy whatever biggest creature I had out there. Then, when I came to kill them, they would throw on minions return. Ooh. Nasty. So if I had put out a bigger creature, then they would just mimic the bigger creature, and I wouldn't die. And then when it did die, it just came right back. It was really, really nasty. <laughs> um and that, that combination, it can also obviously, I think it might be better in green-blue constellation. Um, and then you're just, you're just mimicking whatever creature you need to. And, and God forbid you get the, the one that gives it plus one, plus one and flying. And you mimic that because that just gets way out of hand. I think that this card is easily one of the better rares in the set if you're able to build around it properly. The, yeah. the nastiest thing I've faced down in this format, like easily the deck that crushed me the hardest, was... Uh, I had an opponent that was running a blue-white deck with both Dream Trawler and this in it. And I I had a good matchup against them, too. I had the Liar. Like, I thought that my deck was was favored against them. And I spent all this time trying to lock down their Dream Trawler, and they kept, like, drawing cards on their turn and buffing the power and stuff. And I eventually got it locked down with my Liar, and I was like, ha-ha, you know, like, what are you going to do now, sucker? And then they just, like, slam a Thaumaturge and make another Dream Trawler. <laughs> and I was, like, I just wanted to flip the table, you know? <laughs> yep, like, yep. Get me out of here. Yeah. I got to draft one of these the other day, and then uh, early on in the game, somebody put uh, Omen of the Stars on it. But Omen of the Stars doesn't get rid of the uh, abilities, right? Mm -hmm. It just makes it an enchantment. Mm -hmm. And so I kept turning it into different things. And since there's so many engine cards in this set, I could like turn it into things that still had a relevant ability. And that was a lot of fun. I think the dream is playing it with Warbriar's Blessing because you turn it into whatever creature they have on the board and then you, you have two more defense and bye-bye. I love it, man. I think the best thing I ever copied with this was my opponent's Kraken. The, what's the the kraken that draws you Nadir. that that gets yeah, houses? Nadir oh, it's so good. Yeah, and it was funny because you know they were like they were like, "What are you going to do about this?" And I was like, "Well, what are you going to do about your own creature now?" You know, and, <laughs> yeah, that, what won me that game? That was pretty sweet. We're getting down to it for me as well. Another card on my list that I already spoke about briefly, but I just want to bring up again is Nessian Boar. We don't have to go deep on this, but take this card, guys. Like if you're listening, if you're in green and you see a Nessian Boar, just slam it and figure it out on the battlefield. This card is never going to be bad for you. Jeff was saying earlier, like this thing is just going to be the biggest thing on the board. It blocks for days. If the worst thing that your Nessian board does is block your opponent's 7-7 seven, seven Typhon, that's totally fine. So I just think that this is another card where with even a small amount of imagination, you can often turn the board into a game-winning card. And it just puts your opponent in a really tough position. And it's something like the game becomes all about it. And even if the board is not itself winning you the game... Like, as soon as it's on the battlefield, your opponent has to think, how many creatures do I commit? Do they have a big enough board that they could clear out all my blockers and just kill me with the rest of their creatures? Or, in some cases, I've even had opponents that were in a bind because they didn't have that many cards left in their deck. And decking your opponent with Nessian Bar is something that you might do in this format. So this is one of those cards where like it looks like it can be real bad for you. And I can think of at least one game that I lost when I attacked with a Nessian Bar when I shouldn't have, and it got my opponent back into the game. But 
I think on the whole, you can find ways to make this card good. And yeah, I, I think it's better than any uncommon, not close. Agreed. Blocks everything. Yeah, dude. For five mana. It's a five mana kill anything spell, or sometimes it's win the game, or sometimes it's now I can make it fly, and what are you going to do about that? <laughs> yeah, Warbriar Blessing on a Nessian Boar, that's pretty sweet. I love attacking in with the Nessian <laughs> Boar, and they think, okay, I'm just going to, you know, obviously I block it with everybody, but at least I'll take out the boar. Yeah. But then you have something in your hand to disrupt their combat, so you still get the boar when it's all said and done. And sure, they drew three or four cards, but, you know, a lot of times two were lands anyway, you know, and it's it's not like they can just refill their board. It's not like they're getting a one-for-one one creature replacement. Yeah. Have you ever uh, lived the dream and put the shield on it? <laughs> I have never I have never resolved that card in my magic career. Well, then they can't death, t- death touch it, right? <laughs> That's right. And I'm serious. <laughs> if you do that, I, I don't pick that card unless I've slammed Nessian Boar. You should always slam Nessian Boar. Yeah. And it, if you, I, I would never recommend to play that card. But with Nessian Boar, it's really ridiculous. It's kind of silly. It I gets, like playing it with the Kraken. That's my favorite card to pick up the uh, the old Medusa shield for. <laughs> I love That's a good one, too. We should have a list of cards that would make you pick the shield. <laughs> right. There's not many. <laughs> Early on, I was trying it a bunch with like a bunch of Aura decks and quickly found out there's just a, probably a couple bomb rares I would do it for. Yeah. That's a funny thing. Like If you're playing against an opponent who plays turn two shield, you're like... Either my opponent, <laughs> like either this is going to be an easy match for me, or I'm going to right. get destroyed. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Here comes the Kraken. <laughs> Here comes the or the Nessian Boar. All right, my my last one is the uh, is the put all five together umbrella, and I'll try to make this go quick because I know we're. Man, we've been talking for a while, guys. That's, that's we really, good. Are we going to have a two parter here? Jeez. All right. Um, I'm just putting all the interventions together. Uh, these are extremely flexible cards where almost every time both sides of the intervention matters. Yes, even the stupid green one, I think, can make work. And I've heard people talk about how they've made work, even though I personally haven't. Um, even though I do love the idea of thinning out decks, that's a really fun thing to do. But um, I think every single intervention is first pickable, except for maybe the green one, but even the green one has homes, you know, having the black one exiling all their escape creatures or killing something. The red one being an extremely good card in an aggressive deck where you're either removing a blocker or killing them with a trampler, you know, the, the white one, uh, if you play against somebody that has multiple enchantments, it's just game over. Um, and then you already went over the blue one. I, I like all these cards and, uh, the flexibility is a big reason why I love them all so much. The number one underrated rat on my list was specifically Heliod's Intervention. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, people have been talking about this card like it's not a windmill slam, and I, I just don't understand it. If you have ever gotten far for wand by this card, you know how good it is. People will say like, oh, it's so situational. Like, what if my opponent's deck doesn't have any enchantments? Oh, well, that's really not the you end of the world. Life. You know, you can gain 12 life, uh, you know, in the late game. That's Or if you're playing, you know, any version of white, blue, uh, you can always just discard it with a shoal kraken or with a thirst for meaning. You know, there are ways to cycle it as well. This gets into a concept, and I'm not going to go deep on it, but people will sometimes get this mindset. I think this applies to a lot of the cards I put on my list, like Hactos or whatever. What in, what happens in the situation where it's not good? What if it's not mm-hmm. good? Why would I run it in a situation where it's not good? People come up with this constantly. And and this reminds me of something Deathsea said. Deathsea, limited god, definitely <laughs> authority on the topic. But Deathsea was like, not about this card specifically, but he was like, you can't get into that mindset. That's a losing mindset of wondering, how do I lose with this thing? The question you have to ask yourself is, how do I win with this thing? I'm, I'm guilty of that. I, I talk Sean out of cards because I'm like, well, 30% of the time, this card isn't going to do anything for you. So that's something I need to learn more about. Well, and I think that, it, that it's proportionate to just how good it is when it does work. And so I right. think Heliod's intervention... Like this can kill four things, right? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, the ability to just have it be a one-sided wrath sometimes is so powerful. And I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of this card, and I, I pick it early, I pick it whenever I see it. And 
the number of times it's been bad for me has been very few. And the number of times it has just outright won me the game is high. And it can just be a three mana disenchant one thing, which is sometimes fine. Like it doesn't have to kill three things for it to be a good card in your deck. Totally. I'll even go out there and say that if you're playing an aggressive deck, <clears throat> you might not consider this card, but this card is even better in that deck because when you're racing somebody and they think they're going to kill you and you gain five life and then attack back and kill them, that's that's I've done that. I've used this card for that purpose exactly in one game is because of it. It's very, very good. That's awesome, man. And the, the fact that it's an instant, I think, is really underrated as well. Because just like you said, man, it's like you can hang on to it for the perfect moment. Yeah, yeah. maybe your opponent full out commits their board to a lethal attack and, and you just cancel that, right? Or if you think about just the broad range of things that can happen in this format, maybe your creature gets locked down with a dreadful apathy or, you know, one with the stars or something like that. And then if you are able to remove that enchantment at instant speed and block something, let's say someone makes an attack and you remove dreadful apathy and kill their enchantment attacking creature and now you have a blocker, like it's just such a blowout. So I think that you just, you need to be looking for when can this card be good? And I think with a lower powered situational card, it's a more serious consideration because that 40% of the time when it's not doing anything for you, it's a pretty big cost. I think a good example of that is the four power, I mean, the four cost white instant that deals a, uh, all right, let's start again. <laughs> Triumph, triumphant surge, killing a creature. Yep, that's exactly it. Killing a three power a creature, right? She's like spearing some demon. Th- it's pretty cool art. <laughs> That's an example of a card where like it's situational enough and the upside, okay, like it kills a creature, so that's pretty good, but the upside isn't super amazing. And so I'll often start that card in the sideboard in my deck. Doesn't win you the game. Right, exactly. But when Heliod's intervention is good, it's just so good. So anyway, yeah, I'm I'm a super buyer on this card. So I am curious though, Jeff, how often do you run your Nylea's intervention? I've never done it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done it, but I'm con- it's another one of those cards where I'm convinced that if I was a better player at this format and if I played it a ton, that I my value of this would go up. Probably more so in best of three, obviously, because of the second half of the card killing all flyers. Yeah, I think that that's, that's an underrated aspect of this card for sure. There are certain matchups in which that would just be a total wrecking. Here's, here's my ultimate wombo combo. Are you ready? Nyx Bloom Ancient into Nylea's intervention, searching up every single land from your deck. hey Very nice. <laughs> I love it. I just got a text from Sean. It looks like he got booted. He looks like he's out of the meeting. Oh, no. Unfortunately, so he can't hear us at the moment. Do we want to try to wrap him back in, or, or should we just wrap up the show here since we did just finish the list yeah let's just wrap it up right now and if he's able to rejoin at some point then we'll get to say goodbye to him as well okay well this is going to wrap up our episode ended up going a little bit long today because we just all had such smart interesting relevant things to say about magic (laughs) it's been a pleasure working with you guys i love what you do and uh, I just want to take a moment to to plug that podcast, the Magic Arena Drafting Club podcast. It's one of my favorite podcasts these days to listen to. It's just a perfect combination of deep, limited discussion and like chill hangouts with buddies. I feel like anyone listening to your show just immediately feels like they're hanging out with two of their best friends. You know, it's funny. Sean was like, uh, I want to start recording in this other room because I get better reception, but then you're going to hear my family in the background. And I'm already talking to my family and my cats in the background. I think that that's part of what we try to bring (laughs) because we're not pros. We're not LSV and death C. We can't bring that level. Uh, We do play quite a bit and, you know, I hit mythic sometimes, so we're not scrubs, but what we want to bring is the fact that Sean and I have known each other for 30 years and we love each other and we're best friends. And we uh, want basically to bring other people into that space. Can you guys t- stop talking about me like I'm not oh, here, please? Oh, look who got reconnected. Hey, hey. So, so let me let me say to you, Arjuna, that you're amazing. And the way you break things down and the way that you bring people in is very different than... Jeff said it best a couple episodes back on, a, on our show. You just you bring people into and you make them feel like they're sitting right there with you in your living room 
And that is so comforting. And the way that you break things down makes it simple to understand. And this game is not simple. And you make it seem that way to, to grasp concepts and ideas. And so thank you for bringing that to an environment that didn't have it before. Shucks. <laughs> I'm, I'm blushing over here. That's awesome, man. Well, why are you blush? We we just said a bunch of nice things about you and your podcast. Uh, I don't I don't know if you caught any of them, but you know I, I did. I did. I uh, yeah. I, I appreciate you, man, as well. It's been wonderful working with you, and you know, like I said, I, I look forward to to doing a lot more in the future. See why I like this guy so much? He says stuff like that literally all the time. Just makes everybody around him feel good. Um, we are on Twitter on M arena draft club. Apparently magic arena drafting club was too many characters. Um, I'm not, I'm not on Twitter all the time, but, um, if you reach out to me, I'll definitely hit you back. And also we have some stickers of the podcast logo. If you hit me up and I'll just send it to you for free. We also have a website, uh, magic arena drafting club.com. So yeah, definitely go check those guys out, interact with them, listen to that show. You will not regret it. Thank you so much, guys, for taking the time to chat with me today. Best of luck out there on the ladder. Hey, really quick. Sorry. (laughs) We have to plug you on our podcast, right? People are going to listen to this on our stream, too. So how can they get a hold of you? After that perfect button you put on, I'm just going to step all over (laughs) it and make make a whole new ending. Love it. Welcome to my world. So, so yeah, this is the Arena Craft podcast. You can find us at Arena Craft Pod pretty much everywhere. That's Twitter, Twitch, although I don't stream at the moment, YouTube. You can also jump into our Discord. I'll put a link to that in, in my show notes. That's a cool place to hang out. Do you guys have a Discord? And if not, you should. We, we just got on Discord yesterday to be able to play in this Smash GG tournament. Heck yeah. We feel like old men sometimes, you know. I I am an old man. I'll tell you what, it's like one of my favorite parts of running a podcast is having a Discord. So I I highly recommend that you guys get going. You get to meet your community and hang out. It's a good time. Cool. Cool. Maybe we should join and get in yours too. Heck yeah. I'll I'll send you all the invites. Let's do it. Please. Please. Yeah. And we'll see you on the ladder. Thanks again for listening. I really appreciate you having here. You are the reason I do this. I love sharing magic content with you, so thank you for participating. And again, you can get more involved by following on Twitter, Arena Craft Pod, YouTube, Discord, leave us a review on iTunes, like our Facebook page. These are just a few of the ways you can get involved and hopefully win a $20 prize. I've got some more interviews and special guests lined up for the future, so stay tuned for more on that. Wash your hands, stay safe, and in the meantime, good luck out there, and I will catch you next week.